Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome on behalf of Algorithm Watch. My name is Mackenzie Nelson, and I'm heading our Governing Platforms project. And I'm really excited to, um, for today's event. It's going to be, I think, a real treat. I just got a chance to peek at the Executive Vice President's keynote address. Um, and uh, Andreas will, will introduce her in a moment, but I just wanted to say welcome on our end. Um, unfortunately, we're not in Brussels and I am not in the European Parliament, that's fake news. Uh, that was the original plan, but of course, coronavirus had other plans for us. Nevertheless, I'm very happy to um, welcome everyone today uh, and would like to quickly thank um, Civitatis for, for funding our project and also our project partners um, at the University of Amsterdam and the Mainz Media Institutes. And without further ado, because I know that the executive vice president needs to run pretty much at 1030 sharp, I'll hand it over to Andreas uh, for the more formal introductions. And I'll be coming back a little bit later to be presenting our recommendations and introducing what I think is going to be a really fantastic panel. Thank you, Kenzie, very much for this introduction. So uh, thank you all. Uh, my name is Andreas Aktudianakis, and I am uh, the Digital Policy Analyst at the European Policy Center. So thank you for joining us today for this timely policy dialogue at the EPC about putting meaningful transparency at the heart of the Digital Services Act. The Digital Services Act has been our main focus in this project, and this is why it gives us great pleasure to have with us today Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager. Vice President, thank you for accepting our invitation to speak on this topic. We have followed your work very closely over the years and we have published on the Digital Services Act and provided feedback to the consultations and we hope that our recommendations from this project will be useful to your team as they're drafting it. Um, so, uh, yes, we hope that this debate will help steer more dialogue about putting meaningful transparency in the DSA and without further ado, I would like to offer you the floor as we are all looking forward to hearing from you on this timely topic. Here we go, I think. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be part of the discussion today uh, because what you have uh, been doing over over the last uh, year in, in your project is really impressive uh, and very valuable. Uh, I think the, the whole idea of, of Algorithm Watch uh, and not least the, the governing uh, project, uh, that is, uh, I think, very influential uh, in, in how uh, things will be done uh, in the near future. And I noticed in, in one of the reports that you have been producing, uh, the title, uh, asks a very uh, fundamental question. Are algorithms a threat to democracy? Um, and, and that is an issue that is basically at the heart uh, of our work uh, because the future of, uh, of Europe, uh, how we uh, put our values uh, into reality, uh, how we uh, enable each other's uh, freedoms, well, that depends on how we answer uh, that question. Uh, and it's, it's a surpri surprisingly simple question, but it's not simple uh, to answer uh, because uh, digitization obviously uh, brings a lot of benefits uh, as well as harms uh, to democracy. Um, digital technology that has helped up uh, opening uh, public debate. Uh, it has given many more people the chances to, to have their voices uh, heard. Uh, and that has uh, enriched our debates, ideas, perspectives, uh, many things that we simply didn't know before or didn't see before has, has been able, uh, have been able to surface. Uh, that has helped uh, organize um, protests against uh, unjust uh, governments. Uh, and you can see from the internet blackouts in, uh, in Belarus that those rulers, well, they really understand uh, and fear uh, the power of, uh, of digital uh, communication. Um, and, and the fact that digitization has this potential of bringing us all together as citizens and, and politicians and breaking down uh, power hierarchies, uh, well, that 
sort of gives us the potential of a continuing uh, conversation. Uh, maybe one can, can find sort of a, a, a metaphor of, uh, as a modern version of the Agora in, in ancient uh, Athens, uh, of course, with the caveat that the Agora was for free men, no women allowed, uh, no unfree uh, people either. Uh, so with that important caveat, uh, our digital uh, public spaces, they give a citizen a chance to have their voices heard uh, to leaders, uh, not only at election times, but throughout uh, the year. Uh, of course, uh, the modern Agora holds uh, everyone who wants uh, to join, not just a few thousand people, but billions. And, um, and that, of course, makes for an intense, uh, illuminating uh, discussion. But with so many voices uh, speaking at once, well, it risks uh, of creating a cacophony. Uh, and it's not humanly possible to make uh, sense of such a vast amount of information. Uh, and that, of course, is where the platforms, uh, they come in. Uh, because uh, platforms, uh, they help us to find our way in the jungle of information that's out there uh, on the internet. And they rely on algorithms for them to do that in a quick and effective uh, way. Uh, they use uh, recommender systems uh, to select the things that, uh, that are most relevant for us. The next video to watch, the next product to buy, the next opinion or bit of news uh, at the top of our social media feed. Uh, they use content uh, moderation systems uh, to track down and remove a harmful system from the platforms, uh, whether that content is illegal. Uh, or just against the terms and uh, of service uh, that are designed uh, to stop discussions uh, descending uh, into abuse. And of course, they use also advertising algorithms to target ads uh, exactly at the people that advertisers uh, wants to reach. Um, and algorithms like that, well, that's the secret of success in huge platforms. Uh, but they can also have a serious effect on the health of our democracy uh, by influencing how we see the world around us. When recommender systems uh, choose which information to promote and what then also uh, to hide, they profoundly affect what we know uh, about the world. Uh, we naturally assume that the things that we see first, well, that they are the most important, uh, the most accurate news, uh, the most widely shared uh, opinions. And the things that are pushed lower down in our feeds, well, or removed uh, altogether by content uh, moderation systems, well, those things might just as well not exist. That's good news, of course, when it comes to uh, illegal uh, content. But a lot of the time, uh, it means that these systems are choosing which legitimate arguments and ideas that we see, uh, all without asking our permission or even telling us what they're doing. It's a bit like maybe uh, The Truman Show, just to rewill my, my generation, uh, the film where Jim Carrey uh, lives in a world that he thinks is real, uh, but which is really just a TV show. Uh, the world that we see through these platforms seems so real that it can be hard to remember that it's actually constructed. It is built up through the choices that algorithms uh, make about what we should see. Of course, there's nothing new nothing new at all um, in, in the fact that the information that we see are being filtered uh, before it gets to us. Back in the days when I was watching Flow TV news, they would end uh, the news show by saying, these were the news we chose to show you tonight. They would sort of declare that they had made choices. And the thing is also when you pick up a newspaper, on paper or also digitally, well, you will very often know that they may have a certain 
political leaning and editorial line. So you will have a pretty good idea about what kind of filtering have been done here. Uh, and if you want to, well, you can compare the stories in print uh, with what other uh, papers at the newsstand, what they would have to say. And of course, you can do that with papers uh, online as well. But when the choices of what to show us are made by algorithms, it can be very difficult to understand how they made their decisions. And it can be a jungle uh, to try to understand and judge whether they are giving us accurate uh, information about the world. Uh, in addition, uh, algorithm gives each and every one of us a different picture of the world. Uh, after all, uh, this extreme targeting is one of the great selling points of today's digital uh, technology. Uh, but it's also hard to compare notes. It's hard to check if, uh, if we're seeing the same picture as our fellow citizens, uh, to check uh, whether it's only we uh, who actually, and our uh, social media providers, who actually knows what is going through our feet. So if a recommender, if a recommender system draws some uses down a, a rabbit hole of, of conspiracy theory or violent uh, material, well, then part of the danger comes from the fact that the rest of us have no idea what is going on. We, uh, we don't know the sort of arguments that other people are hearing. And that, of course, makes it very hard to discuss it. It makes it hard to counteract. It also makes it hard to agree. And that is a sense of privatizing our democracy counter to the agora where you were there in common and you could hear the views that you agreed or disagreed with. You could hear the facts that you uh, thought about, uh, whether you thought was true or not. And the point is that this lack of shared reality uh, also can make it easier for uh, these systems to discriminate against some groups of people. Uh, it can make it very hard for us to tell uh, if the ads uh, that we see, that they are being uh, tailored in a way that limits uh, our opportunities uh, because of our gender, because of our ethnicity. And it's often only when you carry out experiments, like uh, Algorithm Watch has done, uh, that you discover that these algorithms, they are discriminating. There's no doubt, uh, in other words, that platforms and the algorithms uh, that they use, they have an enormous impact uh, on how we see uh, the world around us. And that is a serious challenge uh, for our democracy. Uh, because today, a few big platforms, they are increasingly important as the place where we go for news, for information, uh, the place where we carry out uh, our political uh, debate, where we engage uh, with a democracy. And, and we cannot just leave decisions uh, which affect the future of our uh, democracy to be made in secrecy in a few uh, corporate uh, boardrooms. Uh, and that is why one of the main goals of the Digital Services Act, we will put that forward uh, in December, will be to protect our democracy uh, by making sure that platforms are transparent about how these algorithms work and make those platforms more accountable for the decisions that they make. So the proposal that we're working on would mean that platforms would have to tell users how their recommenders, recommender systems decide what content to show uh, so that it's easier for us to judge uh, whether to trust the picture of the world they give us or not. Uh, those platforms would have to provide uh, regular reports on the content uh, moderation tools they use, the accuracy, um, the results of, of those tools. And they'd have to give us better information about the ads that we're seeing, uh, explaining, for example, who placed a certain ad and why it has been targeted uh, at us. And that gives us a much better idea about who is trying to influence us and 
a better chance of spotting when an algorithm is discriminating against us. At the same time, these rules will also give, give more power uh, to users so that algorithms do not have the last word about what we get to see and what we do not get to see. Uh, digital service uh, providers will have to tell us uh, users when they take content down uh, and give people an effective uh, right to challenge uh, that removal. And they'll also uh, have to give us the ability to influence the choices that recommender systems makes on our behalf. Uh, the Digital Services Act uh, will also make sure that regulators get the information they need uh, to understand and govern uh, the way that algorithms uh, work. And researchers, uh, too, uh, need to have access uh, to data that allows us to understand how those algorithms are affecting our society. Because we've seen the impact of the choices that they have uh, made. And we have seen that it's not always obvious until you get to dig down in the data and fully understand uh, what is going on. And since those choices, well, they affect all of us directly or indirectly, that sort of uh, knowledge cannot be a sort of esoteric uh, piece of information that only a small sort of priesthood that works at big platforms gets to see. Uh, so the rules that we're preparing, uh, they would give all service providers a uh, duty to cooperate uh, with regulators. And the biggest platforms would have to provide more information about how their algorithms actually uh, work when a regulator would ask for that. And they'd also have to give regulators and researchers access to the data that they hold uh, including at archives. Understanding the way uh, that algorithms work, uh, making sure that they don't undermine our democracy. That is enough of a challenge at the best of times, but it can be especially uh, difficult uh, when those uh, algorithms rely on artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, AI systems, well, they can make platforms, they can help uh, platforms filter uh, and select uh, information in a way that's more, well, obviously intelligent, uh, but they can also be a black box, uh, making decisions that no one really uh, understands, uh, not even the people who designed it, uh, who put it in place. And in that case, there is no way that users and regulators can hope to understand the logic uh, behind those decisions. Uh, AI can also uh, allow discrimination to creep more easily into the way that platforms work. Uh, if they are trained on, on biased data, they can learn to repeat the same uh, biases. Uh, sadly, uh, our societies have a grim history of uh, prejudice uh, and you need to, to work very, very hard to get that bias uh, out of your data, out of how the systems uh, are working. And if we don't know how they're making decisions, we cannot be sure that those choices are not based on harmful uh, stereotypes uh, and to, to challenge those decisions uh, if they're unfair. So, the EU uh, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI uh, requires AI systems to be uh, explainable to regulators, to researchers, and to users so that we can understand how those systems uh, make decisions. Uh, they insist, uh, the guidelines, that AI systems uh, avoid uh, unfair biases, that users have accessible uh, processes available in order to be able to, uh, to get redressed if they are harmed by those systems' uh, decisions. And, ver and the very similar uh, principle are also at the heart of the global approach to ethical uh, AI, uh, not least in the AI uh, principles that the G20 leaders uh, approved uh, last year. 
And these are the sort of principles that we rely on when we put forward uh, new EU rules uh, early next year to create what we call the AI <clears throat> ecosystem uh, of trust. So, so to conclude, uh, because if we are asking whether algorithms is a threat to democracy, well, the answer is surely yes, they can be, but they don't have to be. Because our democracy has the power to protect themselves with rules that make sure that such algorithms work in a way they should. And in the last few months uh, and years, I think that consensus has been growing that the time has come to put those rules in place. It's time for our democracy to catch up so that it's not a boardroom decision how our democracy will work. It's a democratic decision. It is from each and every one that power comes to our representatives to decide how our society should develop how our democracy should be transparent and for us uh, to take part in. And that consensus that you see, you see it in, in groups in civil society, Algorithm Watch being an, an obvious uh, one, uh, with the valuable evidence that, that you have produced, uh, how these algorithms can threaten democracy and how we can best respond uh, to those threats. We need that insight, we need that knowledge, we need that passion for a democracy that actually works. And we've also seen it from, from other European uh, institutions, uh, like in the excellent report which the European Parliament uh, produced a few weeks ago uh, on the Digital uh, Services Act, or the Council Presidency conclusions from just last week, uh, which give welcome support uh, to our plans for transparency and human oversight uh, of artificial intelligence. And that's what the Digital Services Act is there for, not to undermine the great benefits uh, that we get from platforms, but to make sure that we, as a society, that we're in control. And these platforms, well, they should be what they should be, a tool. A tool that makes us, enable us to make sense of the vast amount of information, of all the many, many voices, and not the guardians of that decide what we can see and what we cannot see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice President, for this comprehensive review. Your, your points go right to the heart of our work, and there's a lot to unpack there, too. Uh, being aware of your busy schedule, I would, I would like to ask if you would have some time to uh, explore with me a couple of follow-up questions we might have, if that's okay. Yes, of course, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, so you spoke about principles, and uh, this, is, this is exactly what we have in mind, too. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, if you could perhaps uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, enforcement of these principles. And uh, uh, we know uh, previously, uh, we remember you have said uh, that we need to lay down a solid and impactful wide accountability framework um, for this. Uh, so I was wondering, you know, what would be the options there for enforcement? How can we ensure that enforcement will have uh, uh, teeth, so to speak, uh, in enforcing the DSA? Well, it's, it's both, uh, both the DSA, uh, but also uh, the framework for artificial intelligence, uh, where this is, this is sort of the heart of our considerations. And we have not taken uh, final decisions yet, because it can obviously be done, been, 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 been done in, in a number of ways. Uh, but the important thing is that it gets to work. Uh, because if, if one has to choose be between something very, very elaborate, but very difficult to enforce or something maybe more robust and easier to enforce, I'm clearly in favor of the, of the last solution. Uh, because I have seen how, uh, in, in my experience in, in working in politics, that the real test of any piece of legislation is, of course, in whether or not it's enforceable. So there are, you know, scaling from 
very centralized uh, European enforcement to networks between European enforcement and national enforcement to leaving it uh, to national enforcement. Uh, I myself uh, think that we need sort of the middle uh, situation. We need a European competence, but we also need for, for member states to engage, to, to engage here. Because as with uh, democracy, obviously ownership is very, very important. Uh, and I think a, a, an ownership among regulators will also be part of the transparency, uh, which is one of the main sort of um, ideas that go through both uh, the Digital Services Act and the AI uh, framework. Thank you. Um, uh, of course, yes, the AI framework uh, together with the DSA, there will have to be synergy there and uh, in its enforcement across the EU. Uh, perhaps uh, perhaps we could also touch a little bit upon uh, on other, other developments that need to be happening in tandem with uh, uh, enforcing the DSA. So maybe here I can refer back to a previous uh, regulatory success, the GDPR, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, set down big foundations for uh, other developments to take place, like the DSA. We have heard that you know there is a, a weak enforcement of the GDPR uh, across uh, some member states due to uh, uh, discrepancies in abilities. Um, so uh, perhaps, you know, if if you can think of any other developments that we need to be uh, enforcing better that is existing legislation um, ahead of uh, uh, the DSA, if, uh, I don't know. Is... Well, um, the thing with, uh, with the G GDPR, which is basically the closest that we come to sort of digital citizens' rights, uh, that you have the right to be forgotten, you own your data, uh, you can have your data, uh, there's transparency. Um, the thing is, one thing is that you set a global standard, uh, because we have seen how, how this piece of legislation has inspired um, countries around the planet. We still have work to do in, in enforcing it and in empowering uh, individuals to make best use of it. Uh, here, I, I, I see that um, technology is, is also catching up here. You see more and more uh, pieces of technology to, to help us uh, enforce our rights. Uh, but I think we me miss a very important uh, piece here, uh, and that is uh, the European digital identity. Because the fact that... Uh, that you use uh, social media accounts to identify yourself, you basically just create, you know, a, a completely open door uh, to all of your data. And that makes it very difficult uh, to, to uh, have uh, ownership and being empowered uh, in, in using your rights when it comes to, to GDPR. Uh, what I, I mean by, by digital uh, identity is, is sort of the same kind of logic that you have in a passport. Uh, the state where you're a citizen would identify you. Uh, and they would do that with the, the, only the needed information to identify you. And they would not pass on more information than what is needed to identify you. And you would know if you identify yourself and your counterpart or your discussion uh, partner, they identify yourself, you will know who is actually there. And I think that's a very important stepping stone in enabling people to control their data. Uh, because right now, uh, it's of course anecdotal and it's just my own experience. It seems as if uh, the more they need your data for their business model, the more difficult it is to see through the consent that you have to give. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for this. Uh, maybe one last question. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, expand uh, a little bit beyond uh, EU and consider what sort of ripple effect the, the Digital Services Act can have for uh, internet uh, global governance, so to speak. How, how can we ensure that uh, as, as a framework uh, and the framework it's going to set in place and enforce is going to, uh, you, know, you know, increase EU conditionality, so to speak, and it's, it's 
difficult to try to inspire others before we know ourselves exactly what we want to do. Um, so, of course, with that caveat, only if, if, if this works, if we are indeed uh, clever and, and lucky and work closely together so that it's, it's good uh, that we can hope to inspire uh, other people. Um, but the thing is, look, looking at the world, um, that there is, there are, I think, two things at stake here. Because more and more people realize, I think, that we do not have an offline world and an online world. We have a world. Uh, which is why there is a kind of, of struggle about then when, when the digital world um, uh, becomes imperialistic of our uh, offline world, when, how, how should governance then work? Uh, for instance, we have seen in, in the International Telecommunications Union, you know, um, uh, someone trying to sort of turn uh, the internet protocols upside down. So instead of this extremely decentralized, ungovernable internet, you'd have a centralized, governable uh, internet. And I think that's a very good example as to what is at stake now. Because what we are trying to do with the, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and the AI framework is indeed to say offline and online, this is the same value system. This is the same world. And, and we want to have the same strong um, uh, rights, uh, empowerment, transparency uh, in the entire world. And this is why what we're doing here is so inspired by the democracy that we have already, by our values of transparency, of accountability, of responsibility that we have already. And I think that is the real fight that is when to take the legal consequences of the fact that we have one world, uh, no matter what form it, it takes or what shape it takes, that we have one world. And this is a fight for a liberal democracy. Uh, we just have changed the battleground as from what it was a uh, hundred years ago uh, when, when women uh, were allowed in or a thousand or a couple of thousand years ago uh, when it was also uh, men and free men uh, only. So, so this is a democratic battle for a liberal democracy where it is still so that the individual, the respects of the individual, the, the worthiness of the individual, the integrity, that is the starting point. And this is why I'm so passionate about it. Thank you, Vice President. This is fascinating and a great pleasure to be speaking with you and hearing from you uh, directly. We are extremely passionate too about the same principles and uh, we hope that uh, we can continue working closely with you and your team in the future as part of this project and other projects. Um, knowing you know, that you must be very busy uh, in your work, uh, I wouldn't like to uh, uh, keep you any longer. So I would just like to thank you very much from, on behalf of the APC and Algorithm Watch, our partner, and uh, the governing platforms uh, project overall. Well, well, thank you very much, and thank you for what you uh, for what you do. And and I sit here with a sense of of envy that I cannot uh, stay on uh, because I would I would learn a lot, and I would really get inspired uh, by the work you do. So of course we will continue cooperating. Thank you very very much. Thank you too. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. I will pass now the floor to my uh, colleague Mackenzie Nelson from Algorithm Watch. Mackenzie, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you so much, Andreas. And I hope everyone is feeling as inspired as I am after uh, that really stellar keynote. And I think also the last question um, kind of brought it to the core of what it is that um, our project has been focusing on for the past year. And that is how we can make democracy um, also, or how we can translate democratic principles into the digital realm as well. Um, for those of you who are only now just joining us, my name is Mackenzie Nelson and I head the Governing Platforms Project now on the Algorithm Watch end. And the Executive Vice President referenced, of course, some of the recommendations that we've been preparing over the past year. Um, but now is our opportunity to formally present some of our ideas. And before I jump right into telling you why we think that data access for research matters, and why we can't have meaningful transparency without it. I wanted to give a quick shout out and thank you to all the organizations who contributed to these recommendations with their expertise and their comments and their time. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without all of you. 
Um, and if you're curious to see who all is behind um, the recommendations, you can go over to our website. We'll also be posting a link momentarily. Um, but first things first, because it's Friday morning, and um, let's be honest, even for the nerdiest of policy wonks, data access for research um, can sound terribly dry. Um, so what we did at Algorithm Watch is we asked an artist to help spice things up and hopefully make things a little bit more entertaining for all of you Zoomers at home. So I wanted to kick things off with a little story. And uh, this is a story about a data scientist working for a watchdog organization conducting research on hate speech and disinformation. And this researcher told us, she reached out to us over the summer and she told us that she started working on these topics because she was concerned that the algorithms that are used to curate, rank, and remove content online were sowing hate and division and that they were creating social polarization, some of the challenges that the vice president also outlined in her speech. Um, and this watchdog told us that she was also very concerned by what she saw as a lack of evidence in policy issues or policy discussions about how to address these issues. And she wanted to do her part to help shed light on what was going on within these black box systems. So she reached out to the platform, as most researchers in her position would do, and she asked them to get access to its API, which would enable her to have access to the information that she needed to understand how platforms were shaping public discourse online. And in order to gain access to this data, she needed to jump through all kinds of hoops. She had to submit multiple requests to multiple corporate spokespeople, and it took months of persistence and waiting and waiting and waiting. But ultimately she did luckily manage to get access to the API. Unfortunately, it wasn't nearly as helpful as she had hoped. Um, the API itself was extremely restrictive, both in, the, in terms of the amount of data that she was allowed to download, but it was also very buggy, it changed frequently. Um, and the whole process from waiting for the data to actually getting the data left her feeling pretty demoralized and unable to answer the questions that she had about what was going on inside these algorithmic black boxes. Now, why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you this because unfortunately this story isn't a one-off example. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Every watchdog working in this space has a similar battle story and they face a similar dilemma. And if, so the dilemma is as follows. If you worked with platforms to, through for example, research partnerships or transparency reports, you usually can't get access to the data that you need. And if you work around the platforms by building scraping tools um, like we do at Algorithm Watch, you might risk legal challenges over terms of service violations. And I'm sure that um, researchers at NYU right now can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so the situation that we're left with is that at the moment, watchdogs are completely reliant on platforms goodwill to get access to the data that they need to understand how technology is shaping democracy. And stories like this show us that platforms self-regulatory transparency just isn't good enough. If we wanna understand automated decision-making systems or AI, if we wanna detect online harms, and if we wanna provide policymakers with the evidence that they need to make decisions, then we're going to need to move beyond the buzzwords. And that's where the DSA comes in with our cheesy um, PowerPoint visuals. We think the DSA is an opportunity for the EU to set the global gold standard in platform governance by tackling the information asymmetries that prevent us from understanding what's going on in the digital public square. That's why we're asking EU legislators for binding rules outlining who can access data and who can apply for access to platform data. We're also asking legislators to base disclosure obligations off of the technical functionalities of a platform service. Because we need information about micro-targeting, we need information about ranking, we need information about content moderation, and we can't be relying on platforms' own definition of what is and is not political. We're asking policymakers for an independent institution, a one-stop shop that can act as an intermediary between the intermediaries and the watchdogs. We want this independent institution to maintain relevant access infrastructure, so that would be public databases, forums, 
and vir virtual secure operating environments so that researchers can access uh, data in a way that's in compliance with the GDPR. We want it to collaborate with national data protection authorities, cybersecurity agencies, and media regulators or bouncers um, to ensure appropriate levels of independence and oversight. And because data is only useful to people who know how to use it, we're also asking the institution to proactively support watchdogs so that they can make use of these tools through, for example, independent, um, through collaborating with independent centers for AI or ADM. And of course, because of the sensitive nature of certain types of data, there are legitimate concerns to be raised regarding potential threats to user privacy. So we think that it's really imperative that this institution upholds GDPR's principles. And the good news is that we've learned through our project that the GDPR doesn't need to be seen as an obstacle. And that's why we're asking policymakers to learn from other sectors and integrate the best practices from those sectors to ensure that citizens can exercise their rights in an easy manner. Because the bottom line is that it shouldn't be easier to access highly sensitive health data than it is to access data about online advertising. In short, we're asking policymakers to make sure that transparency of algorithms isn't just an empty buzzword. Meaningful transparency is hard and it needs to be designed carefully. And it will also take a lot of resources to get this right. But as we've already heard, Europe needs to get this right and it can get it right. Because by now, I hope that I've managed to convince everyone that a healthy democracy depends on a strong and healthy public sphere. And most importantly, a strong and healthy fourth estate. And we can only have a strong and healthy fourth estate when watchdogs are free to speak truth to power and to understand the very public square that is the heart of our democracies. And now, as the Germans would say, we're based in Berlin, of course, thank you for your attention. That's enough for me, but if you want to learn more about the recommendations and read them uh, perhaps in non-cartoon form, then I think uh, someone from the team is going to be linking the links to our website where you can read them in full. And uh, now I would like to pivot over to our esteemed panel um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. And I would like to introduce uh, today's panelists. So I'll just allow everyone a moment here to put their video on so we can see your um, beautiful faces. Great. It looks like we have a full house. So that's um, wonderful because I know that there were some technical issues. Um, our first panelist is Alexandra Gisa and she's of course a member of the European Parliament. You can see on her banner in the background that she's a member of the Greens and the European Free Alliance. And she uh, is a member of the Committee on Budgets as well as the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection. Um, and we'll ask her a little bit about her work there uh, shortly. But then next we have Jeff Oslos, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam's Institute for Information Law. And he was co-author of one of the stories or one of the studies that we commissioned in the framework of this project um, and the on which the recommendations that you've just seen are based off of. And um, in addition to wearing his scholar hat, he also has another hat, namely his activist hat. Um, before working or before going to the University of Amsterdam, he's also worked with Center for Democracy and Technology and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, then we have Dr. Daniela Brunstrup, who's Germany's Deputy Director for General and Digital Policy, Postal Policy, International Affairs and Media at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, quite the portfolio of very different topics. Uh, but among the topics that she's working on is the Digital Services Act for the German government. So very happy to have you here, Daniela. Um, and then we have Roger de Turk, who, uh, and I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm sure that there's a, okay, great. Um, he is a spokesperson and policy advisor to Belgian MEP uh, Chris Getas. And Chris is a member of the European People's Party, the EPP, Christian Democrats. Um, and he is a member of several different committees in the parliament, but for the purposes of our, mo our, of our discussion, it's most important to highlight his role as rapporteur for the, for the LIBA committee's report on the DSA. Um, and now before we go into the discussion, I apologize that we weren't able to have time for a Q&A for our last, uh, or for, for 
the executive vice president's uh, speech, but I do want to give you guys the opportunity to ask your questions. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about democracy, but I must inform you that this is a benevolent dictatorship. So in my role as moderator, I'm going to have to sort through which questions um, I will pose to the panel. Um, but if you do ask questions, please be so kind as to list your name and organization and um, try to be kind because I'll be managing a lot of different things here on Zoom. Um, and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so now over to Alexandra and Roderick. Uh, the executive vice president mentioned uh, the debates last week in the parliament. Uh, and I know that it was a very important week for both of you. Um, the European Parliament voted on three different Owen initiative reports. Alexandra, you were working very hard on the IMCO committee reports as, as a member of that committee. And uh, Kispitas was, of course, the special rapporteur for LIBO's report. And I think the debate reflected the complexity of some of the discussions that you've been having and um, that we've also been having in the framework of our, of our project over the last year. Um, and while we saw some clear areas of consensus, of course, there were also points of contention. Uh, and luckily for us, there does seem to be a broad support around the need to improve platform transparency. Um, Roderick Chris Peters said in the debates that the fundamentals of the e-commerce directive were great, but its greatest issue was in the area of transparency. So my question um, to, to both of you, Alexandra, um, but also Roderick, um, were what were the discussions about trans what did what did the discussions about transparency look like in the different committees and how of each and how are each of you thinking about how it can be made meaningful and useful and of course you represent two different ends of the political spectrum so i'd also be keen to hear what are the main differences do you think uh about how the different parties are approaching how to make transparency meaningful and i see roger you've got your mic unmuted so i would first have you respond to the question and then we'll give alexandra an opportunity to tell us a little bit about um how she thinks about it um all right thanks a lot i did not want to jump the gun by uh, unmuting myself sorry about that alexandra um, so yeah, as was mentioned, I'm the advisor to, to MEP Chris Petis, rapporteur of the Libe DSA reports. Um, it's absolutely right what you've mentioned, uh, um, Kenzie. It's the, the, the foundations of the e-commerce directive. So we're talking about the internal market clause. We're talking about the prohibition on general monitoring. We're talking about limited liability. Those are foundations that really uh, still have a broad support uh, in the, the European Parliament across all uh, political groups, which is really quite remarkable when you think that all of them were written 20 years ago. Um, when we started our, our report, the, the research question, because of the, the Libe scope, was really fundamental rights issues posed. So the, the research question for the, for the report was, how do we achieve a more fair digital ecosystem? Of course, ESA should stimulate economic growth and all that, but that's what's not the scope. So the scope was, how do we fight illegal content online without disproportionate restrictions on, on free speech? And everything was on the table. We talked about uh, prohibition of, of general monitoring. We also talked about obligation of general monitoring. We talked about uh, full uh, liability. We talked about no liability. We talked about obligation for anonymity. We talked about uh, prohibition on anonymity. And going down all of these avenues, we ended up quite frankly, right where we started off by the same uh, core foundations of, of the e-commerce directive. And yet, while that broad support is, is shared by many, you still have an, uh, an, an overwhelming sense that we desperately need a revision and the current rules aren't working anymore. So then the question becomes, uh, what isn't working and, and what, should we, uh, what, what, should, what should we change? And this is why this seminar is, is so apt and, and why the, the, the core element is, is so, so great. It is transparency. The e-commerce uh, directive failed to, to um, you know, explicitly list legal obligations on transparency and uh, um, fail to provide a clear uh, framework for an enforcement of those obligations. And so what you've had for the last 20 years, because of that, as a result of that, is basically a privatization of the fight against illegal content. So this, this idea that where is this distinction of what is possible and what is not possible, has been determined by uh, private companies. And it's a burden that a lot of them never asked for. Um, basically, it's a bit, um, yeah, a lackadaisical attitude by, uh, by competent authorities. I think the follow-up was not there, was not uh, um, yeah, nearly su sufficient, both in terms of expertise, in terms of resources, uh, you name it. So I think the, the analysis at the very start was, 
this transparency is the greatest uh, lack of the e-commerce directive and should be at the heart, at the core of, of, uh, of the new proposal. So that's, I think, the, the, the background of the statement. And it's worth pointing out that this was, was uh, agreed upon by all, uh, all the groups. So we had a lot of uh, discussions. Some of them were, were uh, very much on, on the, the edge and, and there were quite a bit, uh, a few conflicts. You can compare the draft report to the uh, ultimate uh, DSA report. Uh, you can see that it, it changed quite a bit. Um, but on this, this question of transparency, there really wasn't that, that big of a, a question. The, of course, the discussion is, how do you implement uh, this, uh, this transparency? Um, I think to avoid speaking too long and, and to, 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 to you know, limit my time here a bit, um, I think the, the question here on this fight against illegal content is um, you have the issue of, of there's no EU criminal code. So the definition of what is illegal and what can and cannot do is really shaped by, by values. And of course we have common values, but you still see that national definitions vary quite a bit. Yeah. So the idea that you can harmonize this, this fight completely, I don't think that's feasible. And that's certainly not the view of, of KISP. I have to give you a, a concrete example, um, hate speech, the definition of hate speech in, in Belgium and in Poland are, are, are fundamentally different. So it, it's really difficult to, to completely harmonize it. Um, what we could harmonize and what we should harmonize is um, the procedural aspects, how we deal with it, whether we're talking about the, um, a, um, a notice and action mechanism, but also the transparency obligations themselves. And so in the view of, of case Petrus, it really uh, needs to be quite a, a strong and rigorous enforcement of those transparency obligations. They need to be very far reaching, otherwise we're making the exact same mistake of the, the e-commerce directive. Um, and it needs to be harmonized within the, the digital single market. I've got a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll refrain from any additional for now. Great, thank you so much, Roderick. Um, Alexandra, over to you. Uh, maybe just because Roderick focused so much on the, the fight against illegal content, maybe you could speak more to some of the discussions around how to deal with the harmful but legal stuff, which I think is arguably the most tricky area. Um, yes, that obviously is a tricky area. And I have to say there was one party um, that in the IMCO committee, um, so not Chris Peters himself, but um, the EPP that strongly pushed for including harmful content in the scope of the DSA. Uh, fortunately, from our point of view, there was no consensus among the political parties uh, for that. I mean, there was a progressive coalition that very clearly pushed against including harmful content. but. Um, I'm, I'm very happy for that. I think we share common position with the commission as well that also sees um, that regulating harmful content opens the door to complete arbitrariness on the side of, um, of the platforms, um, which are basically monopoles. And it's, it's, it's very, it, it would open up really a very, very difficult situation and this is not what we want. Therefore, we think the way to go is exactly what you are proposing. It is having more insight, having more transparency, because that will also help um, to deal with, with harmful content. And we do agree there's a lot of harmful content on there. I mean, there's a discussion flaring up in France in the past week for, for good reasons. Um, people ask themselves, what, what is the contribution of social network to that kind of polarization of society as France is living right now? And I perfectly understand the debate. I just don't think we can solve it, leaving it to, up to platforms to decide what is uh, freedom of expression, what is content people are allowed to see and what not. That is the task of a democratic society. In, in a state where you have rule of, rule of law, and we still have that in most European countries. Um, so I hope this discussion is not coming back when we get the, it, it probably will, but I hope we will have the same majority focusing on really dealing with, with legal content. Um, we fought for very clear notice and action um, procedures um, that are very differentiated according to, to the gravity of, of the content of the problems the content poses. And I think that's, that's a very important point to make. But the other two important points I would like to make are the ones you've been working on, which is very important, which is transparency, and especially, very particularly, transparency of recommender systems. Um, there's, there was a report from by the Wall Street Journal in May this year that said one third of groups on Facebook are, have extremist content. 
and 64% of the members, so clear majority of the members, joined that group upon a recommendation by the Facebook algorithm. So this is something we need to look into, not whether there is content that, some, that we wouldn't want to see and that some people have the right to see, but how many people are really ending up in these groups or how many people are looking at extremist or conspirational content in YouTube and falling in these rabbit holes? This is what we need to see. And therefore we need the kind of transparency you are proposing and I'm very happy to see that, especially in the IMCO report um, where the, there was a green initiative, um, but the IMCO supported it. And where we really call on the Commission to address what we call the lack of transparency for recommendation systems of systemic operators, including for the rules and criteria for the functioning of such systems and whether additional transparency obligations, information requirements need to be imposed. And we have some similar language in the in the URI report as well. So Parliament is clearly showing the way to Commission that we need obligations there, we need to address this. And I think your contribution is extremely helpful because you really outline what the system could look like, what kind of safeguards we need, um, and, and what could very concretely be done, who should be doing it, um, and so on. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful for, for you pointing that out. I think the other big issue we need to face is um, advertising technology, because we know that one of the big drivers for these recommender systems, for the algorithms, to keep people hooked to a screen, and extremist and conspirational content helps to keep people hooked for the, to the screen, because it's interesting, unfortunately. Um, so we really need into, to look into um, the advertising technology and I think we should have a ban. We are fighting for a ban for a phase out and this is what Parliament clearly called for. With a, with a, with, this was challenged with a split vote by the Renew Group and part, there was a clear majority in Parliament for a phase out of personalized advertising that is uh, based on the collection of huge amounts of data of creating micro profiles of single people and that and directing advertising at them. And this is one of the drivers for extreme and harmful content on, on platforms. And this is something we should also address. And I'm very happy that the both reports, the UE, I'm, I'm not sure about the LIBA report, maybe you can comment on that, um, but the UE and the IMCO report both picked this up and there was a clear majority in parliament that called on, on, on the commission to introduce transparency for recommending algorithms and to phase out personalized behavior-based advertising. Thank you. Thanks so much, just, Alexandra. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. just to, to jump in. So in, in uh, um, Article 40, Article 41, um, Article 6, we were calling for that kind of transparency exactly for that. So it calls for transparency on monetization policies of online platforms, calls for a legal base to uh, assess whether and how um, content is amplified um, by recommendation engines. Um, so I think we're very much on, on the same line there. The one political difference is this idea of uh, um, personalized uh, advertisement. Um, I think in the, in the view of, of, of my boss, Remy P. Kispetis, uh, in certain platforms, the, the risk is minimal and the benefits are quite, uh, quite large. So we're thinking, for example, on, on uh, um, a platform like Zalando, if you have an account on there and they're tracing what you like to to optimize the, the suggestions there the impact there in terms of, of, of harmful content or illegal content or any kind of data is very limited so we would very much be against a horizontal ban on, on uh, personalized uh, advertising just to, to I, yeah i think this is one of the big battlefields um and i'm i'm cognizant that um we shouldn't probably shouldn't try to dive into as as, as interesting as it is um and as Algorithm Watch, we're also thinking about how we want to position ourselves on this question of all out bans. But I think that it's good to see and to hear from both of you that we need better transparency regardless about how advertising is impacting democracies. Um, and once we have that evidence, perhaps we can have other types of um, legislative steps. But I want to turn now to Daniela um, and to Jeff as well, make sure they also have an opportunity to give the word or give their, their thoughts. But um, Daniela, um, we're jumping now to from the EU perspective to the member state perspective. And you're here representing not just any member state, but Germany, which of course holds the council presidency at the moment. And Germany has been uh, an innovator for better or for worse in the area of platform governments. 
Um, it was one of the first countries to introduce transparency reporting through the Netzdegi in this area of harmful, or, or no, in the area of illegal content. Uh, and most recently, Germany's media regulators are thinking more about how to deal with the, the harmful but legal space. And they have amended their interstate media treaty to demand more transparency about the main criteria that intermediaries use to rank and sort information. And um, we know through the course of our project, we've heard from civil society organizations in Germany who work um, with the transparency reports from the Netzdegi, and they've told us that they're just really not good at uh, enabling them to have any kind of insight into how content moderation is happening in practice. Um, especially for, for content that's not reported under Netzdegi. So my questions uh, to you, Daniela, are how, what has Germany learned from its experiences regulating intermediaries at the member state level? And how will it translate these experiences to the DSA now? Um, and then, of course, I'll have to ask you, will Germany be advocating for more rigorous measures in the area of transparency and thinking it more concretely about data access for researchers so that they can understand the more the granular nuances of how content moderation works, for example. Thank you, Kenzie, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you also for inviting me to, to giving you the German perspective or experience we have, because yes, uh, indeed, um, in 2017, in October, so three years ago right now, the Network Enforcement Act, the NetzDG, came into force, and that was after a really fierce, a very intense political debate in Germany because, as, as we see already this morning, this is not an easy debate. Um, coming right now to your question, uh, in fact, we are right now amending the NetzDG and uh, we will contain a new provision which grants researchers access to social network data so that um, they gain insights into the functioning of the platforms and the process of the content dissemination. So maybe this is also a very early answer, but maybe it would be helpful also for the audience if I give a, a short overview uh, about the NetzDG and what it does and how we also enforce it. Um, uh, earlier on, we had already um, the question about the enforcement with peace, and um, maybe it, it's helpful if I uh, present right now what we have done in Germany. So the Network Enforcement Act aims to fight unlawful content on social networks more effectively. That includes, for example, insult, malicious gossip, defamation, public incitement to crime. And we had a fierce debate because, of course, on the other hand, we wanted to avoid overblocking. So the Act defines binding standards for effective and transparent complaints management for social networks with more than 2 million users. The operators of those social networks are subject to the following obligations. They must offer users an easily recognizable, directly accessible, and permanently available procedure for reporting criminal punishing, punishable content. So not the watchdog that has to sit in the waiting room. They must immediately take notice of content reported to them and examine whether that content might violate criminal law. They must take down or block access to manifestly unlawful content within 24 hours, and other criminal content must generally be taken down or blocked within seven days. And the platform must inform users of all decisions taken in response to their complaints and provide justification. So that is also the transparent element. The operators of certain networks are obliged to submit biannual reports on the handling of complaints, another transparent element, and these reports must contain information, for example, on the volume of complaints and the decision-making practices of the network. And of course, those reports must be made available on the internet for everybody. And now coming to the enforcement part, social networks that fail to set up complaints management systems or do not set up one properly are committed a regular, committing a regulatory offense and that is punishable. It's punishable with a fine of up to 50 million euros per company. And to make sure that all networks can be addressed by authorities, they must, um, regardless of where they are based, name a person in Germany who is authorized to receive service of process and information requests 
from law enforcement authorities. So have you been successful with that enforcement act? And it's called enforcement act because of course it's referring to the e-commerce directive and the notice and action principle that uh, is implemented there. So have you been successful? Well, we have evaluated after three years um, the act and the main uh, results are that first user complaints are processed now more quickly and more effectively. And the report also states that there is no overblocking in Germany by social networks, at least not so far. So we believe that we have found a balance between, of course, the need to protect users and on the, on the other hand, to maintain the freedom of speech. So in our view, um, the Network Enforcement Act or cornerstones of them can give an example when we now talk about the DSA and how to implement the notice and action principle and, and how to improve transparency. And as you've asked about the new interstate media treaty, this is uh, of course something that is done by the federal uh, states, so the Bundesländer, but maybe very briefly on that as well. Um, they create now, it passed just this week in the last Bundesland. So uh, they create now new rules for the media industry for platform providers. And for the first time, also for the so-called intermediaries, intermediaries such as Facebook, and Google, and that is new because beforehand the treaty was only a broadcasting treaty. The core goals of the Interstate Media Treaty uh, are to improve transparency and the ability for people to freely form their opinions in the digital age. Under the transparency provisions, intermediaries will be required to provide information about how their algorithms operate, and that includes the criteria that determine how content is accessed and found, and the central criteria that determine how content is aggregated, selected, presented, and weighted. And as it comes into force now, we will we'll have to see how that works. I think there uh, is, of course, an interesting question of, of how to implement that then uh, in reality, but um, we are looking forward to that. And having said all that, um, maybe uh, to your last question about uh, what we, how we see the DSA package, we, we welcome very much that package because uh, we think that uh, after 20 years, um, the e-commerce directive needs a revision um, and that should be adapted to the new digital developments and the competitive landscape that we have discussed already today. So it's important that we establish a level playing field between the service providers in the EU and those established in third countries. And we also share the Commission's view that the current legal framework at EU level, including the competition law, doesn't yet specifically address the economic power that large online platforms with significant network effects uh, have. We therefore welcome the new rules and we have the impression that a lot of other member states uh, are on the same line. Uh, the German presidency has given member states and the commission the possibility to, to discuss uh, these important issues at a very early stage at our informal ministers meeting of the telecommunication council in uh, October. And the ministers agreed on most of the points we raised there. And we are now looking forward to the discussion with all member states and of course also with the public. Um, we uh, have the impression that uh, we will have to hand over, of course, um, the package to our Portuguese colleagues, but we will give the floor to the Commission to present the package in the Telecommunications Council in December. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Daniela. This was quite the rich overview. And I think you also asked some questions um, that we could probably have an entire different webinar um, on, for example, whether or not NetStiggy could be seen as an example. Um, but I do want to give Jeff now an opportunity to maybe dive into some of the nitty gritties. Um, we presented, of course, the, the cartoon rendition of our recommendations, but Jeff worked on the academic rendition. Um, and I think this is, 
particularly interesting in um, line with what you just mentioned, Daniela, about some of the challenges that, that at least we anticipate maybe um, seeing in Germany with implementing the, the, median, the interstate media treaty. How is it that we can actually ensure transparency around um, personalization and um, how algorithms rank and sort and curate content online? Um, so Jeff, the recommendations that we presented today were of course a part of a case study um, where you looked at what lessons we can learn from other legal frameworks at enabling transparency. Um, could you tell us how you decided on the different cases that you looked at um, and maybe what the main challenges are um, for um, the regulators here or those um, public policy experts um, what teams, what, what questions did your team still have about how we can make data access work in practice? Um, so hi everyone and, and thanks also Mackenzie for, uh, for, uh, for, for inviting me to, to join this panel. It's also great to see that uh, there seems to be some consensus at least on uh, transparency at the very least among policymakers. Uh, even though there's quite some uh, um, disagreement on, on the other measures, like the notice, notice and action measures. Um, I, with that, I also want to place a, a huge disclaimer that we should really take care that uh, we do not look at transparency as the silver, silver bullet that's going to solve everything. Um, it is a precondition, you know, for um, uh, for, for, for exploring uh, and, and scrutinizing and identifying many issues. But then we need further, you know, uh, legal uh, rules in, in place, you know, to, to take the next steps. So that's important not to lose sight uh, of. Um, and and um, getting back to those policy discussions, you know, in the platform governance, transparency has been this, this common denominator in most of these discussions. And uh, as sort of like when we were uh, starting to, to work on this specific report, we got a bit uh, frustrated because everybody agrees on transparency, everybody agrees on data access, but um, when you really dig down, it's hard, like how, how should this actually look like uh, in practice and how should this be operationalized? Uh, what should the governance structure look like uh, and so on? And this, this, this requires perhaps less, you know, uh, flashy, uh, sexy work, but really uh, requires more, um, um, uh, I guess, a long, um, uh, more, yeah, more, more work in trying to explore, you know, what, what the necessary safeguards are that we need to consider uh, for this. And so we took a step back for that uh, from the platform governance debate, which is such a rabbit hole, you know, it's easy to get lost in and lose sight of the bigger picture. Uh, and, and, and really looked at this, this broad range of transparency and data access frameworks that we have in place already in many different uh, um, sectors. And so, um, 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 there's, there's, there, there's a lot to be learned from these other transparency frameworks. Uh, and, and we haven't come across really uh, other studies that did a comparative analysis of what can be learned you know, from these existing frameworks, some of which work well, some of which work less well, and what we can learn specifically for the challenges that we're facing in this platform governance debate. Um, and so we selected uh, two case studies based on sort of two clusters of issues that we identified uh, in, in, in the platform governance transparency uh, debate. And the first one is sort of what we called the, uh, the incentive problem. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, platforms have very uh, strong disincentives to, to provide meaningful transparency uh, and data access um, for a variety of legitimate or less legitimate reasons. Um, and, and, and then secondly, um, a cluster of issues relates to GDPR uh, concerns. Uh, much of the data that we would like to see uh, released by platforms raise significant data protection issues um, and that we might not leave up to you know, the platforms to decide on uh, who gets, to, uh, gets access to that information. And so for the former, the, the incentive problem, uh, we looked at this EU regulation with a, a very sexy name called the European Pollutant Release and Transfer Register or the EPRTR EPR regulation. 
but so in short, this this regulation, um, you know, it lays down this this quite advanced uh, and and tiered transparency infrastructure, which is specifically targeting economic actors with little uh, to no incentive to be open about their you know their polluting operations. Uh, and so far, it seems to be working uh, well. I mean, there's issues with it, but if you want to uh, dig deeper, I'm happy to elaborate later, or you can read the report. Um, and then for the second uh, um, cluster of issues, so GDPR concerns, we looked at a sector where highly sensitive personal data uh, is sh shared for research purposes, uh, the health sector, even more relevant in, uh, in 2020, I guess. Uh, and so specifically, we looked at this very recent initiative in, in Finland called FinData. Uh, it's not about financial data, uh, it's, it's about the health data. So FinData is, is for Finland, uh, of course. Um, and so in this, 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 uh, this case study, there's at, at the center, there's this independent uh, institution uh, which facilitates access to potentially highly sensitive personal data to potentially any researcher in the world. So we basically conclude there that if it works for medical data, it sure as hell should work for you know, social media or other platform data as well. No. That doesn't mean it's an easy task. Uh, there's a lot of like, hard work to do you know, in, in devising this uh, robust transparency uh, governance structure, uh, but we've, we've set out some best practices that we think are quite useful to consider and uh, yeah, and, and I hope it might inspire the policymakers to do so. Thanks so much, Jeff, for um, this overview into the kind of nitty gritty details. Um, and you make our point also for us, which is very convenient for me as a moderator and um, advocacy uh, person in the room. There was a question that I thought was really interesting um, from Elizabeth Hoffenberger Pippin. I hope that I have that um, down right. She was asking about, um, this was during the, uh, the executive vice president's keynote, but I think it's nevertheless interesting also for our discussion and it came up throughout the course of the project. Um, if we're obliging service pri uh, providers to submit reports regularly to authorities, could there be a risk that some EU countries use this as an opportunity to shut down service providers that don't follow the political line? Um, so here, how do we kind of toe that line on the one hand of, of wanting platforms to be more transparent, but at the same time acknowledging that we're dealing with very delicate issues of freedom of expression um, and that it can be easy for governments um, that are perhaps potentially illiberal. And here we don't need to look at authoritarian regimes. We can also look within the EU um, to some, some rather troubling anti-democratic trends. How can we make sure that we, you know, on the one hand, hold platforms accountable, but on the other hand, also um, make sure that governments are held accountable and not kind of forcing platforms to um, or, or punishing platforms if they don't carry out the political agenda. So maybe I would ask um, our EU policy folks for their thoughts on that, how to kind of toe that line. Yeah, should I start? Um, we have asked uh, that question ourselves because it's an absolutely relevant question. And it's, it's, it's a very fine line, as you say, because the risk is always there the fact is the risk is already there because we know that um, especially right-wing extremist movements are very good at using the algorithms of gaming the systems so um, that exists whether you have the data or not i think and, and you have that in in every kind of system that requires transparency for example transparency on financial transactions you can always argue that there are some countries where it's good if dividends can dissidents can hide their money and the government doesn't have access to that but that's not a good idea for not having transparency in in, in banks for example um, anyway so that that is a problem and we have to acknowledge it i think we can approach the solution in two ways in Europe, speaking of Europe specifically, where we have um, two countries that are clearly problematic um, and a series of others that have issues. Having a European agency, as you are proposing it, that helps at least to balance the whole thing. 
um, because I hope that you know Europe will remain a democratic continent even if we have a few countries that are not considered democracies by independent think tanks anymore, like Hungary, for example. But as a whole, it's still a continent which with a strong democracy, I believe. The other point is what, what you focus on is this, this broad network of institutions working together, watchdogs, journalists, and so on, to having a really broad network, what you call the fourth estate. I think that helps as well, that you don't have only one centralized agency that's responsible, but you have a lot of watchdog of investigative journalists, scientific institutions that can issue opinions and statements and influence a public debate. Uh, one thing I like a lot is, is an idea that was brought up by Article 19 and David Kay and other people, and it's the idea of having social media councils. So having civic councils or of independent experts um, or even something like the Irish Citizens Council really with, with normal people who could then take the results coming out of the transparency process well explained by journalists to translate the data into um, intelligible language and who could then sort of promote a broad debate on, on the results and in order to discuss what do we want, what don't we want. I think the feedback from this council would also influence the platforms and help to check on, on governments that might try to abuse this data and this transparency. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, Roderick, if you want to quickly react, I just act, ask you, yeah. keeping an eye on the time to keep it short. Um, and then if, uh, if unless you guys, uh, Jeff or Daniela, want to also contribute, then um, I can go on to another, try to squeeze in another question before we um, go to our closing remarks. All right, I'll keep it as short as possible. Uh, I think the three draft reports all mentioned um, uh, an EU agency in one form or another. It's uh, worth pointing out that that language was toned down in all the final reports. Um, I think in the Libre report, the, the language is still one of the, the, the strongest. I'll briefly read it out. Um, so supports a strong and rigorous enforcement by an independent EU oversight structure. Why, why is Kiss Beatus advocating for this? Well, basically, we talked to, to some representatives of our member states, uh, non-German ones, to, <laughs> to be uh, specific, um, who made it very clear to us that, uh, for example, analyzing the algorithms and the effect of the algorithms was beyond their current expertise and was beyond their funding. So I think in, in the way we set up uh, uh, oversight and enforcement of that oversight, we should be mindful that this is a, a European digital single market and, and the effect it goes beyond uh, one member state and therefore the enforcement should go beyond one, one member state. So I think there we're on the same line. Uh, quickly on, on the, the rule of law and, and the, the, the issue of, of undemocratic governments, um, it's one of the core challenges of the European Union. I don't think we need to, we need to be coy about that, um, but that's an issue that you have to tackle at its root. Uh, and you cannot, uh, uh, for uh, out of fear of that, um, you know, compromise every other piece of, uh, of legislation. So I think the the, the remark of, of MEP uh, Geese was was absolutely on point in that, and I can only support it. Okay, um, thank you so much. I just got my timer going off, saying that we only have five minutes left, um, and there were a couple of questions that I would have loved to dig into. Um, about whether or not um, or, or how we can prevent transparency from just being something like a cookie wall um, where you click, 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 and yes, 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 um, and it's not kind of meaningful in any kind of way. Um, but I would direct you there to our report, perhaps rather um, selfishly, we, we thought about that. Um, and um, then I would just like to ask all of our panelists for a quick rapid round here. Uh, we've shared our vision with you all about what we see as absolutely necessary for the DSA, namely transparency and data access for research. Um, now, and, and we also heard from, from the vice, executive vice president what her vision is for the DSA, and I was also very pleased to see that uh, we seem to be very uh, values aligned. Um, now, I would like to hear from you. Imagine you're 20 years into the future and uh, the DSA has been enacted and um, life is great, there's no coronavirus, and what does the, what does the internet, the post-DSA internet look like in an ideal world? Um, Jeff, would you like to start us off? I'm just gonna pick on you and then maybe we can go to Daniela and then Roderick and Alexander, you get the last word. 
no pressure at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think perhaps a point that I really wanna, wanna to, wanna, want to emphasize here is, that, I mean, we're talking a lot about the, the, uh, um, transparency in order to hold platforms accountable, and that is surely a vital uh, element to consider. Um, as an academic, perhaps, uh, I'm biased, but I think it is also crucial to consider the broader uh, need for transparency simply to understand, you know, these digital infrastructures that penetrate, you know, virtually every aspect of our lives uh, and to simply, you know, enable research. I mean, uh, um, um, and, and so in that regard, uh, I think it's also important to keep that transparency framework uh, relatively uh, neutral. Uh, we also advocate for this, for an independent, you know, institution that would enforce and oversee uh, such a transparency framework um, and, and also advocates that it is just, its mandate is limited to just a transparency facilitator uh, that can then perhaps interface, you know, with competition authorities, com uh, consumer protection agencies, data protection authorities, uh, and different interest groups. Um, but but so, so as to prevent, you know, this institution from being politicized uh, and, and um, and really enabling uh, the many, you know, social scientists uh, and, 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 and many researchers in other fields, you know, to, to uh, get access to the, the data that they need in order to do their research. So that's what I'm hoping for, I guess, like that in 20 years, we have this, this vibrant, uh, you know, civil society with academics and activists and journalists having really the, the tools to, to and, and being equipped and valued, you know, for, for their role as public watchdog but also, you know, to investigate uh, social uh, issues more broadly. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Daniela, it's on to you, and I would remind you to please keep it short. <laughs> okay, I hope that we will have then a modern regulatory framework that uh, foresees new responsibilities for platforms, but without setting obstacles to innovation and small and medium-sized companies. Um, I would love to have a framework that is improving competition and also protecting citizens. Thanks. Thank you. Very succinct, Roderick. All right. So keeping it short, um, I'd like the internet to, to remain a beacon for, for free speech. I think that's, that's crucial. I would like to see stronger attention of, of competent authorities uh, uh, on the internet. So a framework where what's illegal offline does become illegal uh, um, online. And uh, that can only be achieved with, with a meaningful and transparent co-regulatory uh, approach. So that's, uh, that's my two cents. Thank you, Roderick. Alexandra. Yes, I basically agree to what the previous speaker said, and I would like to, to add, I would really like to see it as a space for freedom of expression and also freedom of expression for women, for minorities, for vulnerable, vulnerable groups, because even if we formally have freedom of expression today in the internet, studies show that 50% of women, for example, are afraid to express their opinion there because of hate speech. And therefore, I would like really to see this, this free and vibrant democratic space with a lot of different actors and where everybody can freely and without fear express his or her opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, uh, for closing us off there. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today and I don't want to keep anyone past the time because you've already been very generous with your time, but I would just like to close by saying, or by returning to some of the remarks that we heard already from the executive vice president, um, that you know, I, I really like what she said that the online world and the offline world are kind of one and the same. And that really what we're fighting here is for liberal democracy. Um, and, and I think also for me, so maybe just a personal note, the reason that I became interested in these topics to begin with uh, is because I'm from the US and next week is a big week for us. As you can imagine, there's a lot of discussion about the extent to which um, platforms have been involved in you know, creating some, some real challenges for democracy. And um, so I think, unfortunately, um, we're not going to be the ones to lead here. Uh, and a lot of people, including many of the signatories uh, to our recommendations, are, are looking to Europe. Um, so it's important that Europe get it right. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your visions as well. It's not um, every day that you get to think very positively about the future of the internet. Um, so I think that's a nice note to go off on. Um, and then I would just like to thank 
uh, the panelists for joining us today. I would also like to thank the Executive Vice President for her keynote. It was stellar. I'm excited to put it on our website. I would like to thank the Algorithm Watch team, especially my colleagues Panalika and Annalena, who helped me uh, with the visuals a lot. Um, and the EPC team, of course, Johannes uh, did a lot of work in the background. And then also everyone who was a part of this year long project, um, including our academic partners at the Mainz Media Institute and University of, Zamster of Amsterdam. And then Civitatis, who pays the bills and keeps the lights on, um, the internet on. Uh, well, actually, that's me these days. Um, and then lastly, the organizations who signed on. Um, and again, I can point you to our website um, in the box. Don't know where it is for you. Um, but please do check them out, share them, um, spread the word, and have a nice rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>